Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mike Manazer, and my day job is with the Boeing Company, a little bit of time in the Navy. Uh, this is not church. <laughs> I see the Bubba's way back there in the corner. I got Gucci right here. Wonderful to have everybody. We are the only thing standing between you and beer downstairs, so we get that. So we're going to make this uh, really, really a good hour, and thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, the defense industrial base of the United States has awesome potential. We're not realizing that potential. Our call to action is how industry partners get together with our government sponsors, government partners, and be able to turn that potential energy into kinetic energy with our products. So our panel is made up of luminaries from different companies that work in the, in the defense space and that have great ideas on how we can go forward, how we can take industry resources and put them on top of government resources. So what I'd like to do today is introduce our panelists and then we'll move into questions that we as a panel have determined are, are gonna set us off and then there's a single microphone right here behind the screen. Move to audience questions. When I start to see a line behind the microphone, then I'll shift over to the audience and we'll have just a nice dialogue here. And, um, so don't be afraid to move up front. All right, this is gonna be a little bit of a trick. I'm gonna read a bio, and this is audience participation. I want you to point to the person that this bio is. So this person is the chief executive officer at Rebellion Defense, software company building the modern mission stack to detect and defer adversaries at scale. Previously, he was founding director of Defense Digital Service, his team launched high power programs, including Jedi Cloud and Hack the Pentagon, provided technical expertise on the DOD's most critical technology challenges, including the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter and next generation GPS OCX. He is a serial entrepreneur from Seattle, where he founded venture-backed startups and led engineering teams and enterprise companies. He's a fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center and lecturer at Stanford's Community Science Department, where he encourages nerds to serve in government. Any guesses as to which panelist it is? Okay, good job, Chris Lynch on the far right side. Uh, we did not get the memo, we all would be in hoodies. I wish we'd have talked to Chris early. Next to him is Chris Brady, is the president of General Dynamics Mission Systems, global leader in delivering C5 ISR capabilities to military and intelligence community customers. GDMS employs more than 13,000 professionals working in more than 100 facilities worldwide. Holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the University of Arizona, Master's from Stanford, and a Master's from Arizona State. Arizona State is a common, common school here on our panel. <laughs> Secretary Sean Stackley, Senior Vice President, Strategy, Growth, and Technology for L3 Harris Technologies, bringing forward strategic planning, U.S. international business development, engineering, and program excellence to drive warfighting solutions for customers. Secretary Stackley is a former naval officer who, after retiring from the Navy, served on the Senate Armed Services Committee staff before being appointed as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition, serving from 2008 to 2017. He also served as the act Acting Secretary of the Navy from January to August of 2017. And I will tell you that Mr. Stackley used to have this pile of eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper at the end of his conference table, Mike Manazer took that stack down about halfway whenever he would teach me on what I needed to do as N98. Amy Gowder, next to me, uh, is the president and CEO of Defense and Systems of GE Aerospace. She brings a wealth of industry and leadership experience to her role as the president and CEO of GE Aerospace's Defense and Systems Business Unit. Today, Amy and her team of over 3,500 employees have oversight for over 26,000 engines in service for approximately 300 U.S. and international military customers. Prior to GE, Amy held senior leadership positions with Aerojet Rocketdyne, Lockheed Martin, and Accenture. Amy's also a graduate of Arizona State University and MIT, and I will embarrass her, because I know this, she used to be, or was, named a top 40 under 40 aviation executive by Aviation Week, and is inducted a member of the San Antonio Women's Hall of Fame. So congratulations. I'm gonna start, thank you. I'm gonna start with Mr. Stackley. With his wealth of experience, I want him to kind of describe what he used to see from his, his various positions. 
and he'll start the dialogue with us. So, so Mr. Secretary, you're in your fourth career now. The Navy, Hill, Research, uh, Development and Acquisition, Secretary of the Navy, and now Industry with L3. In your unique perspective, what's one or two things that Department of Defense needs to focus on better to meet the warfighters' needs? And similarly, what's the one thing industry needs to focus on better to meet the warfighters' needs? To ask the colloquialism, what, what would keep you up at night if you were thinking about industry right now? Yeah, okay, let me, uh, <clears throat> one or two, this is a target-rich question, so um, I want to be careful about uh, uh, what the Department of Defense could do better. You know, for the last two days, uh, uh, we've received a number of briefings, discussions, panels about all the things that are going right. And so before talking about what we could be doing, what the department could be doing better, I think it's worth just kind of highlighting what's going great. You know, I, the Secretary of the Navy, you know, just, you know, hammering $250 billion Department of the Navy budget. Um, not too long ago, it was $168 billion, and a number of things I could have done with the additional $90 billion uh, would, have, would have gone a long way towards helping the warfighter. And so if you think about what the department's job is, well, number one, number one in terms of the Pentagon is to deliver a budget to the Hill. And uh, the fact that uh, the, the Navy is carrying so much weight uh, in the defense budgets going over to the Hill, that's, that's huge, okay? So what are they doing right? Well, first and foremost, they're, they're advocating uh, for the needs of the Navy. Um, so you know, he, uh, he used three words that I yearned for. Affordable, stable, predictable shipbuilding program in the budget. And if you're in the uh, shipbuilding industry, that's what you yearn for. Affordable, stable, predictable. So another huge thing that's, that's going well. Um, AUKUS and the international presence uh, in this, in this uh, symposium. You know, AUKUS is huge. Uh, th those who uh, have any remembrance of the beginning of the Polaris sales agreement, the Polaris sales agreement wasn't about what can happen in the 1960s or 70s. It's what needs to uh, uh, be put in place for security over the next century. And that's what AUKUS isn't about the 2020s, okay? AUKUS is about the, the, the rest of this century in terms of national security, building international partnerships, and in this case, with our two closest uh, allies. Um, Jay Stephanie, in, in his talk yesterday morning, he, uh, he highlighted the use of OTAs, okay, where the department is looking, how can we go faster? And so OTAs was a tool that was put in the toolbox for the department by Congress and the Navy's starting to get practiced at using them, all, all to the good of the defense industrial base. Uh, so there's a, there's a number of things that are going very well. I mean, uh, Admiral Grady talked about uh, JROC reform, and it, it, I think he took a good, well-placed shot from the ACMAC, um, but, uh, but the intent is there in terms of uh, making sure you got the requirement right, getting the budget behind the requ requirement, and speeding things up. So uh, what could the department be doing better? Pick up the pace. Okay, there's still a lot of slack in the system. And everybody here that's in industry, uh, you're feeling the pain that comes with that slack that's in the system. Pick up the pace in terms of setting the requirements, in terms of the budgeting process, and in terms of getting on contract. So it's, uh, well, well we, wanna, we want to uh, uh, give credit for all the initiatives that are, that are in place, the, the pace has to pick up. And uh, I think Hondo hit it well. You know, he talked about, you know, the industry's gotta close the, the, close the loop in terms of the, uh, the business, uh, uh, you know, the, the business equation. And if you've got a long period of uncertainty, you're not gonna be able to close that loop. If you're not certain that, that there's gonna be money following that experimentation, you're not gonna be able to close that, that loop. So we've gotta pick up the pace, put industry in a position where it can invest, it can push its resources to, to help deliver those capabilities that uh, the department is going after. Thank you, sir. And, and you know, Secretary Stackley talks about the system that we're in. Pick up the pace and how, how do you disrupt that system? So I'm gonna go to informal Chris next. You know, I, I would love to just ask you, you know, state-backed cybersecurity or cyber attacks continue to increase. It's no secret, of course, that cybersecurity cuts across all the systems that we have, uh, every aspect of our daily lives. I think most of us are sort of aware of that risk and, and what's out there. Your company puts tools into the battle space to sense and help warfighters act. What I want to ask you is, a lot of big companies that already have fielded systems, 
balk at the cost of being able to put the protections into those systems and protect against those cybersecurity threats. So it's a little bit of a complex question. Knowing what you know, how do we go fast, like Secretary Steckley talked about, but also then start to protect our systems? How do we protect legacy systems at the same time? It's a great question. So um, there's an interesting thing that's happening here, and, and I think that everybody is aware of it, but I think it's important to call out. There's this transition that we're going into uh, what I think of as this software-defined defense world, right? The systems that we rely upon, the platforms that are used against adversaries, the things that we're looking uh, at imagery, the sensors that we're using, all these things are being fused together by the incredible effective use of an implement implementation of software. And that's new, that's a new thing. And it, when you look at that problem and you say, wow, we're almost everything that we're doing, all advantage in the future, at least when we think of how these things are gonna be used, are probably going to be delivered by software. Well, what happens if that actually doesn't work? <laughs> what if it breaks down? What if it didn't deliver the results that we want? And it's not about where we're going and new, fantastic, amazing things that we haven't yet envisioned, but it's also the legacy platforms that you've mentioned before, the things we already have deployed. We have to be able to rely on those systems in order to have advantage and stay, you know, stay uh, in front of our adversaries. So your question is, is an interesting one. In a world in which almost everything that we're gonna rely upon in the future to have an advantage against adversaries, how do we make sure that we can ensure that those systems are actually gonna work? And I think that for everyone here and everybody in the department, and you think of uh, Sean in his previous role and think about as we envision and build and uh, acquire new systems in defense, we have to think of this stuff as not just being uh, a, a problem that, that we can just deal with in the future because the terrifying part about it is we actually have adversaries that are pretty good at this stuff. China is investing in the ability to have long-term persistent access to systems that we rely upon. We are watching and, ha and saw even with Russia attacking Ukraine, we saw an opening salvo in which Russia went in and was looking at ways to take down communication systems and critical systems on the uh, not only on the world stage, but with the Ukrainian military as well. So how do you move fast? Well, I think that there are a couple things. If we can all agree that it's very important because we are heading into an era of software-defined defense and we can all agree, I think, that warfare in the future is probably gonna look like an evolution of what we're seeing play out in Ukraine and Russia right now, uh, I think that we have to do a couple things. One. Um, we have to just admit that readiness is not just something that is uh, about force structures. It also includes the sort of cyber readiness of the systems that we're using. It, in, it includes the ability to be sure that those systems can not only be compromised, but we can rely upon the data. So if you're thinking about uh, uh, you know, how you're going to modernize legacy platforms or you're gonna update things, you should be thinking about, hey, how do we how do we build in the ability to trust those systems? How do we make sure that we're including that? Um, are we actually testing these things from the perspective of an, of an adversary? Um, when I was at the Department of Defense, we worked on a program called Hack the Pentagon, which brought in ethical hackers from all over the world to go and attack the most critical systems that the Department of Defense used, including weapons platforms. And I don't wanna ruin it for everybody, but a lot of times they actually did a pretty good job. And so when you see that, I just go back to this thing, which is we have to admit that it's important. We have to say, hey, we're going to bring in best of industry approaches in order to completely shift how we think of readiness, including on the cyber side. And, uh, and we have to move fast. And I think moving fast is mostly this. Um, start small, just go prove out things. A lot of times, I think in the Department of Defense, I think the biggest weakness is that people just go and say, hey, we're gonna, do the whole thing, we're gonna do this really big thing all at one time. And when I think about it, I think maybe that's the wrong thing to do. Go prove out that we can actually put 
uh, new defensive measures in place on the cyber side uh, and prove out the value and then we can point at it and say that's a way that works. And I think that that is something that the department across the board, especially in the adoption of software and technology, can do a lot, uh, do a lot more and a lot faster by not trying to do the whole thing all at once. I'm gonna go to formal Chris. <laughs> this one, you know, I would venture to guess that General Dynamics Mission Systems is probably not a startup. <laughs> Been around. There's some history here. The way that GDMS does business, you've got tests and and more tests and fielding things, and we need to get it to a certain level of capability. And so, if you thought about how you would do differently, how C5 ISR program sort of riffing on what informal Chris just said, to get speed to the warfighter, and here's the fastball, how would you disrupt yourself? <laughs> well, um, in order to disrupt ourselves, um, I, I'm gonna also uh, give myself the moniker of being hardware Chris, uh, next to software Chris, because uh, in general, fielding software quickly in an agile development process, uh, DevSecOps, pipelines, you can crank things out, get it to users, have touch points, iterate a couple weeks, continue to improve very rapidly. We were applying those principles to hardware to disrupt ourselves, and, and going into model-based systems engineering has allowed us to make a lot of progress there because uh, in many respects, the next release of your hardware design is actually another drop of software. It's a file mm -hmm. you know, in one of your design tools or so forth. So, we're already doing that form of disruption uh, in, in terms of iterating more quickly. The challenge becomes how do you then get it from that testing to the field? And um, uh, our observation, uh, and I think many of you might have some of these stories as well, is that it's always hard to get requirements nailed and get all the way through a program to developmental test. Um, there's exacting, the requirements are unforgiving, our technical performance measures are precise, and we tweak and we develop and we get there. Uh, but then you have another chapter called the operational test. And that's where warfighters, or, or at least surrogate warfighters, take it and use the system in a completely different way that's probably more relevant to what the mission really is for them. So, so for two reasons, this tends to be a problem. First of all, the world changes from the moment I have a requirement, write down requirements, go get some funding, get a milestone A, get Congress to fund it, get it allocated, get its uh, uh, source selection and then an award and then the inevitable protest. Finally, you get to the point where you're developing something. It could be years later from that point where you had a strong requirement to the point where you're actually trying to field something. Well, the world changes. TTPs change, you're, you're, so the warfighters out in, in uh, the MAGCOMs are out there with a different idea of what they're gonna get and how to use it. So that's the first issue. The second issue is, rightfully so, an operational tester will wanna play with the system, try to break it. That's okay, we want them to do that. But the problem is when we're doing operational test at the very end of the program, after we've spent all the money and we've taken all the time, and now we're in overtime or double overtime, begging Congress and begging the service to keep the program alive while we resolve the issues found in operational test. You try to get the operational testers to come in sooner, and usually the answer is, eh, no, we'll, we'll see you a little further down the line. Well, what we really need to do is make hardware Chris's world more like software Chris's world, and allow us to iterate earlier with real warfighter touch points. Now we can do that with small products, like so certainly in, in my army side of the business, we hand people radios, they go play with them, they go try to break them and so forth, and we iterate on the design, make them better and better. But when we're building some of the larger systems, like some of the things we do for the Navy, it's not so easy to say, here, give this thing a try and, and then take it back out of the water and uh, you could tell us what you thought. So, uh, but we can get operational considerations into our requirements and into our developmental tests earlier so that when we get to developmental tests, it looks a lot more like how people are really gonna use it so we can field it, not run out of time, not run out of money, and actually deliver something relevant. So that's, uh, that's both how we're disrupting ourselves and, and how I hope it works going forward. Very good, before I go to Amy, you mentioned model-based systems engineering and then you moved on. 
Mm -hmm. tell, me, tell me where you, th you think model basics and engineering could solve this problem you just talked about. Well, uh, again, I, I'll say that it, you can't uh, develop a whole hardware system, send it out to test, and, and iterate on that. It, it, it ends up being too expensive, too time consuming, and so forth. What you have to do is develop a, a model that represents all the physical behaviors, and to include the software, and the behaviors of the hardware under all kinds of environmental stresses and kinetic impacts and, and physics. And so increasingly you can model that pretty effectively so that you're, you're not gonna actually create something and bend metal till you've gotten through all of that modeling and you have a design that has withstood all the uh, virtual versions of the physical challenges. So then you can build something, sometimes you can just 3D print it even, and then get it out into people's hands or put it up against real kinetic threats and see how well it performs. But you don't want to be doing that until you've learned all the lessons you can learn in the virtual world. So that's the idea. I happen to be a believer. Uh, I think that's right. I think at the edge of technology is getting to the point where we can do that effectively and still create a, a good program. So Amy, so the, the secretary talked about speed. We got to go faster. Hardware Chris, software Chris get together and all of a sudden surge happens and here we go. As a prime engine OEM to DOD, we start to ramp up. What's the challenge to you if all of a sudden war clouds are on the horizon? Certainly, and um, I'm gonna answer the question, I'm gonna build off model-based system engineering first and then go to the hardware side of it. Um, we've seen with model-based, we can cut those design cycles in half, but then there's the speed of trust because the customer might not be used to seeing the data that early. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the design go through its maturation. They're nor used to these normal PDR, CDR reviews, right? So I do think there's um, a process and cultural aspect that we've got to work through with, um, with all the services and understand as we iterate and we do reduce the cycle time, um, when do we connect and how do we connect um, in that model-based world? I think that's still a, an opportunity and a challenge for us, quite frankly. Switching to hardware, I mean, I think we all have seen um, the supply base challenges, and it's easy to point to, in particular, the electronics allocation issue that was the first to hit to really stifle the industry. The, um, the uh, United States government has stepped in with the CHIPS Act. They've really worked to ramp that back up. We still see challenges in the metals market, and of course, with castings and forgings, there's a lot of artistry there that unfortunately with the retirements and the layoffs, we've lost that um, expertise. But what I'll say, um, as I look through the threads and as GE actually goes into some of our supplier shops and often sends mechanics when they're having labor shortages, what we're seeing is really it's that workforce. So, you know, it's the, really the talent and ingenuity of the workforce. And I think the Navy is leading the way on shipbuilding and starting apprentice programs and a welding program and investing in our youth. And I think we've got to accelerate that pipeline. Um, I'll give you a stat in Ohio, Warren County, Ohio. They have a welding program, have 30 students go through it, 29 of them you know, still want to do welding, had jobs right when they walked out. What was shocking to me was they actually had 250 applicants. So there's a demand from industry for this skilled labor, and there's a demand from our youth to have really productive, high quality jobs, and yet our supply system isn't working. So I think we, as an industry, it has to partner with both state and federal government, quite frankly, to get these programs and to get the funding so that we can produce the high quality workforce. And, and they wanna come, and, and that's not just welding and machining, it's also, I think about robotics and advanced ma additive manufacturing and advanced techniques. That's a different technician that we've got to train the workforce as well as software, frankly, apprenticeships. So I think that's our first, what I would emphasize, because when we need to be ready for surge, it's not just about bending metal, it's about the artisans and the, and the skilled workforce that's ready to do it. And the second thing I would say is quality. So we've kind of, we as an industry have lost um, some of our commitment to systematic quality and we saw as these artisans left the industry, the tribal knowledge that left with them, we weren't relying on process control. We weren't allow, going back to the basics of quality around managing variation. 
So we've seen um, in many of our suppliers that it's, it was really what was in someone's head as opposed to really looking at the process capability. And so I think we as an industry have to get back to that commitment um, on you know, what they, frankly, the automotive industry learned this almost two decades ago now with PPAP and APQP of how do you build in systematic quality. So if we want to ramp and we want to be resilient, I think it's about priming the workforce pipeline and getting our commitment back to quality. Amy, I'm glad you brought up the workforce. I've heard a quip that this generation doesn't want to go into manufacturing jobs. What would you say about that? And then I'll turn it to Chris. Yeah, so I, um, I don't see that. So I see the workforce. I was just down in San Antonio at Standard Aero and, and, they, and they were hiring like crazy and they had the um, apprenticeship program had strong demand or the example I used in Ohio where they had 250 applicants for welding and they could only put 30 through. That, you know, the, um, not everyone, we love our baristas, don't get me wrong, we all like a good Starbucks, but they, they don't all want to work um, at Starbucks and, and play video games. Many of them do want a challenging career path, at least, you know, the, when, we're, when I'm out there talking to them. Yeah, good. Chris? I, I, w I just wanted to add this, uh, add to this piece about um, bringing people into defense, and maybe also tying it back to the question of speed. Uh, it strikes me that most people want to feel like they're part of something that is deeply important. Most people want to work on something that they're having an impact. Uh, they want to create outcomes. And I think that that drives so many people. It's interesting because when I look back at my time in, in defense in particular, I, I've been very interested in bringing people into the defense sector that would have never shown up before. Um, and I think that it all comes back to this idea of people want to work on something that matter. They want to work on problems of impact. And so when I, when I look at that, I, I'll, I'll just tie it back to speed and the challenge of speed. Um, at least in the software engineering world, and you're looking at this, um, when people are coming from companies that are working on probably a, you know, Anything out in the commercial sector. Now it could be that they're working on an ERP system, or they, you know, maybe they're building databases, or they're doing video filters on TikTok, whatever it might be. Um, over the, in that world, everything's very tangible. What happens is, if if they come into defense, and the things that they're working on take a long time, take years, it, it's it, they actually begin to lose faith that they're gonna have an impact. And I, I think that falls on us. We have to help create the outcomes. And I'm not just talking about the people on the stage. I think we have to create the outcomes that people want to show up and matter. And so when you're thinking of, hey, how are we gonna use, you know, I haven't even talked about artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision. Well, we're probably not gonna really get a lot out of those systems if we can't update them every two years because those models will be built around outdated TTPs. So we have to expect more. We have to demand more. And I think then in that, when we set those conditions, we create a place where we will bring in the talent that wants to be a part of this. When I started Rebellion, 2019, nobody used the, the phrase defense tech wasn't really being used. Now I hear people say, oh, you're in defense tech. I'm like, man, <laughs> I can remember when I was pitching venture capital firms and they'd be like, well, the venture capital shouldn't invest in defense because it's too slow. It's not an interesting market. You know what? Expect more. Be part of the solution that's going to drive the thing. I think that it, it is a whole series of industries, including the government, and the people who are setting the policies. So I'm all in on this idea that it is about the people and that we have to, we have to change the conditions. And you know, I'll just, one interesting thing, just because it happened a few days ago, I just got a quote from a customer on s something that they're doing. And literally, a piece of software took something that took six weeks previously, and they now do it in less than a day. It took six weeks, six weeks! And now it takes less than a day. How many of those things are there? How many are there? I'll bet you there are infinite amounts of those things that we could change. And I think that we, 
it, it, I think if, it, if we set our expectations around that, we can change a lot. Yeah, there's a great, I, I love this conversation. So Amy and Chris, thanks. You know, appreciative inquiry. You ask questions. Why is it that way? It's really great. Uh, many of you maybe have seen the Axios feed last night. There was a section on trust at the very beginning. At the bottom part talked about who young people wanted to work for, Google and the federal government. <laughs> so it gives me hope that the, the, the youth of America want to make this a better place. Um, I'm going to ask Secretary Stackley, we're going to go a little formal on something here, but that microphone is open. Gucci Klender's looking at me funny like he doesn't want to hear any more questions from the moderator, so please come up with your questions that are more interesting than what I'm asking the team and, and come to that microphone. And as soon as that happens, I'll quit asking questions. So Mr. Secretary, as, as a program is built through what, what uh, Chris, hard work Chris talked about, we go through all of those steps. Based on those steps and what we know, there is an independent cost estimate from several places that comes in and says this is the cost of that program. And before we move forward through the milestones, there's going to be a Navy and an OSD independent cost estimate. If we apply some of these things that Chris Lynch is talking about, if we use model-based systems engineering to shut down the test and T&E requirements, if we have no precedent for that kind of approach to our programs, how do we cost that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, it, it gives me a flashback to giving a talk to a business conference not too long ago, and I flashed up a quote. Uh, the quote was attributed to an, an anonymous northerner, and he was describing how southern farmers used to estimate the weight of a hog, and they would find a plank, balance it, and put a hog on one end, and then the other end, they'd find a rock that looked like it was about the same weight as the hog and, and put it on the other end until it balanced. And then they would guess the weight of the rock. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I've gained a, a my, my days in the Department of the Navy, I didn't fully appreciate uh, the independent cost estimators uh, for a couple of reasons. One, if they didn't have a good methodology that you could trace, then it was just another random number. Uh, but two was, it's, it's not about coming up with a pinpoint estimate. Let's, let's recognize when you're estimating something for the first time or that you, know, you, you, you don't have a commodity pricing model, it's a range of numbers. And across that range of numbers, there are variables that come into play, and you really need to understand what those variables are. And it's not a, simply about the cost estimate. It's about how you're going to control those variables so you get the right outcome. And so today, when we start to uh, plumb areas where the, the models don't know, and I tell you, the, the toughest thing to estimate is going to be software. Mm. And, you know, we've got a pretty good record of getting it wrong every time. And of, of all the things, you know, systems integration is tough, but software is the toughest. We don't have good parameters in terms of how we're going to measure progress. Um, and and uh, when um, uh, the government, uh, for example, goes to estimate, they're going to be very conservative. And so the challenge is, if you think you've broken the code um, and you've got a, uh, a, a lean, agile approach towards developing software, then how do you get the government buy in on that estimate? Well, uh, they're not going to buy in, okay? What, what they'll probably do is, is, you know, hopefully it's a competitive environment. They'll run the competition. They'll bring outside experts in to assess uh, the various bids, and they're going to put a risk factor on top of it, and uh, then they're going to put a contract type around that to um, balance the risk between the customer and uh, uh, the, the agent, um, but they're going to make sure they've got their risk covered in terms of the budget. And then over time, as their models start to become mature and they become more confident and uh, comfortable, that range will narrow down so that you've got a much finer estimate in the risk. Uh, you basically start to retire the risk associated with that. In the meantime, in the meantime, all that extra budget that's being tied up to the uncertainty, that's budget that could be going to buying warfighting capability. So it's, there's no quick solution. Uh, but the, the sooner you get there, and you get there through practice, uh, the better. I think that the clarion call that you just said to the defense agents is to accept that kind of methodology, and as you start to move faster, is to think about how you cost that stuff differently. All right, sir, and, and if you and you, and then everybody following you, and you're going to line up to the door to ask questions. Uh, please, just who you're from, your name, and then the question for whomever. 
Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Howard. I'm with Accenture with the organizational analytics team. We provide an evidence base for talent and organization. We've heard about rocks, software, hogs, hardware, software, bending metal, forging talent. Uh, I'd like to ask a question, a slightly different pivot, which is what are you doing as executive leadership team members to change the leadership behaviors and drive the new leadership behaviors, not just at a, on the shop floor, but at senior executive levels, to drive the kinds of talent and organization and workforces that you require to, to execute for the armed services missions. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start. I'm, ha I'm passionate about this topic. So, um, you know, GE, uh, with our CEO, Larry Kolp, is really implementing the lean operating system, and it is as much a culture change and a leadership behavior and um, there's some key elements around leaders that um, are inquisitive and that leaders that ask questions and co coach the team through questions that use data to define the problem and not just jump to the solutions. And the hardest thing is to define what that problem is and get the team to think through the solutions in a very methodical way. So that it's almost a Socratic method, quite frankly, of leading. And it's one that the current generation really you know, thr you know, thirst for. They want the younger generation, those engineers coming in, they want to be part of the solution up front. They don't want to have to do their time. And so, you know, getting um, a leader to be engaging and inclusive through problem solving as a way to drive the team is really what I'm seeing shift the culture as opposed to here, go do this assignment, let me direct, come back, I'll tell you, bring me a rock, come back, I'll tell you I'm wrong or oh no, you're just a junior engineer, um, you know, you have to pay your dues, that, that the current culture rejects all that. And so I think that problem solving approach that's inclusive and about the data and about thinking through the, how do we solve this problem in a methodical way is what's really resonating and frankly changing the culture to bring new ideas forward because they have a form to do it and a structured way to do it. And it's also, frankly, how we're getting breakthroughs is using that kind of problem-solving methodology to do the speed, to take the six weeks into one day. You know, we took a, 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 a T700 part um, that had, you know, 10% you know, yield, 90% scrap, and in just three weeks, we're able to reverse that um, to yield 90%. That would have taken probably years in order to get there in the five-day Kaizen event couple weeks of implementation, they were there. So it's amazing when you unlo unlock the power of an inclusive team through problem solving. So that's what we're doing in GE. I guess I would add uh, that uh, most people's experience of any company is gonna be primarily around their direct manager. That is probably 80, 90% of it. And so uh, if we're not helping them, first of all, picking them carefully, helping them to understand those behaviors that matter, and then, uh, and then making sure it's really happening, then the, the experience uh, for keeping the right people won't be there. One of the things we're doing there, because uh, we do a lot of the things that Amy was discussing as well, is, is to focus on first-line leaders. So we actually have first-line leadership training, which we've rolled out and really focused on and getting a lot of feedback on and, and, and continuously improving. But the other thing we're doing, uh, which we found a very helpful tool, is the, we use the Gallup Q12. Uh, it's a survey, simple 12 questions, very, very straightforward, very quick. Uh, and yet it is uh, well documented across thousands of organizations of all kinds that these correlate very highly with uh, employee engagement. And so uh, as we look at those, we can look at those down to the manager level and see which managers are in truly engaging their teams and which ones need some help. And some of the times, the ones that need the help don't even prove to be uh, capable of managing. Sometimes we remove people, not because of a score, but by our then subsequent observations. Uh, and, and the thing that happens the most, because uh, we're in a lot of engineering companies here, is you know, we, we take great engineers and of course they're gonna be great managers. <laughs> and uh, well, not always. Um, and so we, uh, some of them we are happy to return to individual contributor roles and it turns out they are happy to return as well. So. I have a super tiny thing just to add to that. Um, it, it should not be, at least in this, I'll speak, I'm a nerd, so I'll talk about software, but in the software world, 
Um, an individual contributor should be able to make as much or more than a manager. Or a, absolutely. It, it is just the case that some, for whatever reason, we have ended up in a world where somebody's like, in order for me to do better or make more money, I have to manage a team. How silly is that? How silly is that? We have some amazing software engineers, and we take that away. So keep them in the place where they excel. Make them, make the incentive structure be the thing that you want. Don't take them out of the technical role. Make them actually make more money and do better. Yeah. What I love about this is we are talking and debating the most important asset of our defense industrial base, which is the people. Is Absolutely. Very good. Let, Let me add to that. Go ahead, sir. Um, yeah, please. You hit metrics, which is you know critical. Talk about training, talk about individual contribution. Uh, there's a culture thing here as well, right? And uh, I think I can speak for all the, all the defense industry that uh, uh, when you talked about uh, uh, association with the mission, it's a, it's a noble purpose that we, that we support, okay? And so while you look to attract, train, and retain the right talent, it's also ensuring that your culture is as closely tied to that mission as it can be because we're developing and delivering capabilities that we're gonna put the hands of America's treasure, our, our youth, and ask them to go to war and then uh, fight and win and come home safely. And when the workforce understands that imperative, they're gonna put their shoulder into it. Yeah. It's gonna be about the mission. They're gonna to want to come to work in the morning. And so for us, you know, we're, I think this is probably true across the board here, is you know, 20, 25% of our workforce is prior military. Many of our sites are co-located with the customer. They're on site continually providing that, that feedback. And so the workforce sees it, they understand how important it is, what they're doing, and they'll go the extra mile, they'll lean in, and then there's the, the details associated with the contract. We, we you know, ultimately, uh, I didn't ask you to answer the first, second part of your question, what can industry do? Real simply, deliver in accordance with the terms of the contract. The customer's not asking for anything more than that. The product, meeting its technical performance on schedule and getting the workforce to understand you know, those metrics and how are we doing in terms of schedule because time isn't just money when it comes to war, time is lives and they get it. When you free that workforce to be able to deliver to that higher mission, that higher calling that Chris talked about, you're gonna, you're gonna speed up. I will clunder um, in my face. I have this spotlight, but you, sir, are brighter than the Brother, uh, you called me out, so I figured I'd better stand up and say something. Um, <laughs> but truly, I, Chris, Chris, Sean, Amy, truly impressive group for us to listen. And so I kind of have a tough question, and I promise it's not a whining because it's, it's industry and it's government, and you'll, you'll, you'll get my point in just a second. That fantastic panel we had this morning with Admiral Grady, right, and Bill LaPlante. Everybody's saying all the right things. I'll just say I talked to one of them afterwards in a nice, just kind of comfortable setting. I said, the, you know, the one word nobody mentioned ever, Chris, speed, got it. Chris, iterating, beautiful, Amy, workforce, Sean, requirements. I think we're all getting that, I really do. What's the word we never heard? Contracting, contracts. <laughs> And I'm being honest, we in industry don't do it great, government doesn't do it great, and how come we can't ever figure that one out? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little passionate here because I promise you, I think we understand the requirements. Chris, I think we understand how to go fast. Chris, I think we know how to iterate quickly and get, get our hands in the water. Amy, I think we have the right talented people to do it. I think we need to scratch on that one really hard, and my question to the audience and to the panel is, where do you think there's some sweet spots in there where we can make a difference, government and industry? So I'll throw that to anybody nasty, so but I'll really, I just feel like I that love, would be one. Thanks. Um, Mr. Stackle, your view on this. Um, so I think there, there has become a, um, we're gonna sit on two sides of the table and we're gonna throw things over the table rather than collaborate. So I'm seeing that over and over. And I'm seeing, um, on industry, we are not documenting things, and so we end up in letter writing com campaigns rather than if we had been really clear and communicated when we saw scope changes or when we see issues on our side and we're gonna slip a schedule. We're not having those detailed conversations. And it all starts actually in negotiations. We're not, we're just passing back and forth and we're making interpretations 
you know, I, I think the alpha contracting process helped with that at times. I know not everything can go through alpha, but the iterating and actually sitting down and talking and saying, this is how I interpret this clause, and this is the risk I associated with it, and this is what's gonna get priced in. And we're not having those kinds of conversations. They're happening either way too late when we're in trouble, um, or they're happening through letters versus ha having a conversation. And this is where I'd like your view. I think the contracting community back 10, 15 years ago was trained more to be collaborative and somehow in the last yeah, couple me, decades we've gotten apart. So I don't know. Yeah, your no, view no, you're, I, it's, it's a little bit more than that. I, uh, it, it, several things. Um, well, Admiral Archer, so he's got it tattooed and if you were paying attention, you'd have the tattoo as well. Um, I, I pounded on the team. Uh, do not write a contract where one side can win and the other side can lose. There, there is no win-lose when it comes to contracting. Win-win or lose-lose. And we've got to be smart collectively, government and industry, in terms of the structure of that contract to ensure we're not in a win-lose situation because we both go down uh, in that case. Um, I used to, I had a whiteboard and I, I simplified all of contracting down to you know, like five words. What does the government want? The government wants affordable performance. And what does industry want? Profitable workload. You might debate that, but profitable workload. And then what's that fifth word? Risk. And where you dial that risk in, that's in the contract. And if you don't have that balanced out, then you've got a win-lose situation, okay? And so uh, the, the team, and it's not just contracting, it's program management. The, the, the team has to come together, they have to be able to communicate, can't, you know, there's a tendency to shut down communications when, when it gets close to contracting. That's the worst thing that can happen. You have to have open communications. Everybody has to understand, here's the performance, here's the cost, here's the risk. And then it's got to be balanced across that contract. And we've got right now, I'm, I'm going apoplectic in terms of some of the contracts that we're seeing, fixed price development contracts. <laughs> that's, that's a violation of good sense. Or, or worse yet, a, a, an LRIP, a fixed price LRIP, that's tacked onto a cost plus EMD. That's, that's like a feel good with a poison pill. So how, how does industry price that out? I'm trying to get the government to, to take a look, open your eyes, see what's going on here. Now what do I think the root cause is? You said 10, 15 years ago. Um, it's, it's not a brain drain. I think we've lost a lot of skill and experience at the senior levels of the organizations, but you know, across the services when it comes to contracting and also to program management. And then what ends up happening is the, the teams default to almost a templated approach to writing a contract. And they do not understand how to balance that risk out. And sometimes they do imagine that there is a, a viable uh, win-loss proposition across a contract. There is none. Okay, and so it's that, that degree of experience and maturity that comes with having done things many times over, um, it's kind of like estimating something that you haven't done before when it comes to software. If you haven't done it before in terms of contracting, you might just load it up with risk. Imagine you're pushing that risk across the table, not recognizing that the customer and, and the defense contractor, we're handcuffed together. We either both win or we both lose. You know, the other thing that needs to change is, uh, you know, we're talking about agile development where you can, at each touch point, um, understand what changed, add a few things, subtract what isn't working, and, and make it better. Uh, we do not have agile contracting that can follow that. So, uh, you know, I, uh, not in the Navy, another place where we do business, uh, we had a contract that was all agile development, uh, built on mutual trust, made a lots of changes, mostly ads, <laughs> not as many deletes, and then we got to the end, and uh, the contracting never caught up, and it was a disaster just a, you know, a unmitigated disaster for all parties involved. So uh, you know, the, the contracting has to keep up with the agility of the development if we want to deliver capability fast and responsibly. My experience starting in 2009 and ending in 2017 in requirements will lead me to tell you that that question by Admiral Clunder is what we all take out of here. When you're talking to your government partners, that's what needs to be fixed. The rest will follow, speed will follow. But the idea that the secretary talked about in order to uh, 
uh, change the way in which you do contracting where you don't have a win and a loss. And a defense industrial base is trying to give something to a war fighter to go fight the threat that's outside of our borders, not inside of our borders. That's what we need to fix. Editorial comment by the moderator, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rich Patterson. I work with the Naval Postgraduate School Foundation. And one of the priorities of our foundation in recent years is to help the school uh, develop strategic corporate partnerships. So rather than a single year research project, everybody goes their own way, finding long term sustainable partnerships that benefit students and faculty at the school, the Navy, Marine Corps, all the services, as well as the companies. And I'm curious uh, if a couple of your panelists might be able to give uh, example from, from their firms as to uh, collaboration that they have done with operators out, right out of the field. As you probably know, the students are 8, 10, 12 years in to service, a lot of operational experience. Uh, they come back with a lot of things on their mind, problems they're trying to solve. And I'm, I'm wondering as we're trying to learn how to best uh, create cooperation with, with industry, if there are some examples or advice you could offer in how to help facilitate in this process and, um, and whether you think maybe there is enough of that already or whether your firms would be looking for more of that. And I asked the question in the context of a, a, a Naval Innovation Center that we're working with the school on because our belief is the creation of that center will create much more opportunity for industry partnership with the school. Thank you. Uh, I was just gonna say, it, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I'll go back to a few things that I have seen that are very helpful. Um, one is, I, I, I love the idea. I think it is incredibly important that we bring people who are serving into environments that let them, uh, you know, again, I'm a nerd, so I'll always talk about nerd things. But I, I love having people show up and get to spend time around our software engineers watching how we build software and products. I can't tell you how important it is, and even thinking about the last question, if people understand how software technology is used, deployed, outside of the constraints, and I think of, and, and the constraints and sometimes even the constrained imagination of the fields that they're operating in, sometimes in their, in, when they're deployed, it opens up a whole new way to start to think about things. Um, maybe it was last year, we had four um, uh, very junior uh, officers from the Navy who spent maybe a month at our office, and it was awesome. It was awesome. They were engineers. Uh, each one of them were software engineers. Um, it's unclear if they're gonna have a software engineering career in the Navy. Uh, but the cool thing about it is they got to experience what it's like to build. Build something for the mission. And they get to go back and then, you know, they're gonna be part of that mission. And then they can start to think about how do we start to connect those dots. So um, companies like us, I think that we love having those types of, uh, those types of people come. Naval Postgraduate School, we actually is a customer of ours with our adversary innovation product. And we do a, quite a lot with uh, Naval Postgraduate School. And I think that it is, I would highly encourage other, uh, others to, to open up and bring people in and just give a, a broad exposure to yeah. uh, the technical creation of some of this stuff. Because I think it, it literally changes how they do everything from that point on. It, it's like such a spark. I think that internship or apprenticeship, it's really about immersion. That's yeah, what we're that's describing. Right. And they need to be immersed for you know six to twelve months to really get that. And so I think standing standing arrangements like what Chris is describing is the way to go. And we both get benefit. I'd, I'd tack on to that. Right now, experimentation is the coin of the realm. I mean, uh, the fleets out there. You know, you hear about Fifth Fleet into Paycom, Fourth Fleet's getting into it, Third Fleet. They're heavy into experimentation and development squadrons standing up. So industry is, is engaging with the fleet through this experimentation process, and that's a good opportunity to add you know, these, these post-grad students in terms of an, an internship, get their hands on the product, the experimentation, the warfighter requirement, and that 
in that environment, very unique environment. It's a it's rapid learning capability there. Sir, you're going to ask us the last question. Okay. Th thank you all very much. It's a very enlightening panel. My name's Frank Yelnick. I'm from Navair, Pax River, from the headquarters side. I've sort of got three hats. I'm the critical item management policy lead and process lead for Navair Enterprise. I do anti-counterfeit, mainly from the acquisition side, and I also do supply chain management slash subcontractor risk management. As I'm sure all of you know, the... Uh, Defense industrial base is a lot more complex now than it's ever been. There's many more tiers in the supplier chain, and I make sure when I tell people this, I don't mean supply chain as in logistics chain. It's the tiers, sort of like a wedding cake of suppliers feeding in to most of you who are primes, as it were, in an end product. But that also means these risks that you were mentioning also and are going to be much more complex to deal with, whether it's the software related, perhaps, risks that come with digital manufacturing, digital quality control, digital logistics and parts tracking, or uh, the vendors that may be in a precarious financial position, simply because they're so small at the very bottom tier, are now providing parts to maybe all of you simultaneously and other primes. Uh, that sort of lends itself to a further sort of consideration and thoughtfulness that we're talking about surge capability in case, you know, heaven forbid the flag goes up and now we've got to replenish war stocks instead of just doing just-in-time manufacturing, which works great in peacetime, but not so great when people are shooting at you and you're wasting bullets and uh, uh, blowing, getting, losing some uh, uh, weapons platforms. And also because you've got these smaller companies way down, they may be great, their resources by themselves and, and knowledge to be able to deal with these risks. And some of those, I would, I would just suggest that that includes uh, not just like risks associated with critical items, they may be critical in terms of your schedule performance or your meeting your cost targets, as well as because if, let's say, if a potential adversary knows that that mom and pop shop at layer number six services 20 different programs if somehow I get a bug into their system and crash their CNC machine, I know I've now taken down 20 programs and let's start the clock. We go to war in 30 days. Now I know there's no spares coming and our production lines shut down. So I, I was just wondering sort of two things related to that. From your standpoint as industry leads, dealing with that complex supply chain and this multitude of tiers with that multitude now of entry points for these risks, how would, ha, have you been given that much thought and ways of dealing with it either individually or collectively as sort of a DOD industrial family of, of, of uh, friendly competitors as it were in some cases, but in dealing with this, especially since many of you use many of those lower tier uh, uh, vendors and, and uh, suppliers. Thank you. If I don't finish this on time, Tracy is gonna kill me. So we have a minute and 25 seconds to answer that question. I think it's a yes or no question. I'm going with yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. I'll be real quick. Two, I think two things have to, I think we have to take advantage of data analytics. So I think there's a lot of data and sensing out there that we can do on financial health, on you know, trends in their individual performance. So we've got to use the data. I think that's a new, uh, relatively new technology that hasn't been there. I don't think it uh, substitutes surveillance. So I, you still have to get boots on the ground. So we're amping up both of those within GE. I'd, I'd say we've matured our muscle in terms of managing the supply chain tenfold since COVID. And it's everything from alternate sources of supply to being able to design out for uh, uh, or equal type of uh, systems, uh, but uh, partnerships with, the, with your providers. And that's probably been a key piece is just establishing the partnerships so that you get the trusted, reliable parts on time. You know, we've got some AI-based software and from several sources that track all those layers um, and, and learns in iteratively. So you're starting to get a sense of how that web all works. And it has caused us to avoid certain suppliers and to go help others. We do a mentor-protege program to help certain of them to stay afloat in this environment. 
Uh, I think that your concern is a valid one. We should always assume the supply chain and the, the systems that we rely upon will be compromised. It is the best way to actually have an asymmetric advantage as an adversary and take out the majority of what your opponent is doing without having to drop a single bomb. So I think that your concern is right, so what do you do? I would highly recommend take your concern and start to think about how do we reshape and rethink strategies around that and actually do something. Contracting came up, it's, there's no magic here. We actually have to defend those things and we have to consider them just as important uh, as anything else that we're doing. It's part of how we're gonna win. I'll, I'll just add this in-house. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> We'll catch you question. afterwards. Great end into a great panel. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. round of applause for our panel. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.